Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings be, be upon all of you. Thank you so much for uh, whether you are here joining us uh, in the virtual space in person here, uh, or if you are seeing this uh, later on, inshallah, may, may Allah bless you. Uh, but let's begin. We begin in the name of Allah, uh, the most gracious, the most merciful. Uh, and we give thanks to Allah for the opportunity to be able to gather again uh, in this space of Inside Islam. Uh, as you all know, uh, Inside Islam, or if you don't know, Inside Islam is a monthly interfaith service or intrafaith series that's created by Muslim Space for the purpose of focusing on diverse communities of beliefs and sects within Islam. Um, and these conversations uh, and these events happen kind of in the form of uh, informative lectures uh, with respective community members, scholars, um, and others uh, within the communities uh, from different uh, backgrounds, different sects, uh, followed by a Q&A session. And today it is my absolute pleasure to be able to uh, welcome to the space uh, a dear friend uh, and former classmate, colleague, still active Facebook friend, <laughs> Alijan uh, Daya um, from the Ismaili community. Um, Alijan is a senior software engineer with an academic background in Islamic studies. Uh, Alijan graduated from the University of Texas at Austin in 2018. And uh, he graduated with a triple bachelor's uh, degree, uh, degrees in Islamic studies, computer science, and the Canfield Business Honors Program. I can attest to that because I took his graduation photos and I remember all three of his stoles. So mashallah, very accomplished person here. Um, and he recently completed his Master of Theological Studies in Islamic Studies from Harvard University in 2023. Uh, alongside his professional work, Ali John has contributed to academic discourse in the field of Islamic studies. He has delivered over 25 lectures on Islam, Ismaili theology and history to Ismaili and non-Ismaili audiences, and has also presented his academic research at prestigious academic conferences, including at Princeton University and uh, Leiden University. Um, he has taught uh, religious education to Ismaili students for over seven years. Um, so. Uh, I want to pass this uh, mic over to Brother Ali John. Again, it's such a pleasure to have him here uh, in this space. And just a friendly reminder before we hand the mic over to uh, Brother Ali John, uh, please keep your mics muted for the rest of the audience. Uh, and please ask questions. Definitely ask questions. You can drop them in the chat. You can message them to me directly. Uh, and we will definitely field them uh, right after uh, Ali John's presentation. But uh, without further ado, uh, Brother Ali John, I would like to uh, pass the mic off to you and uh, thanks for being here. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Um, yeah, Osama, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak today. Very, very honored to be here. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen real quick. I have a, I have a presentation, PowerPoint presentation um, for everyone. Um, so as uh, Osama mentioned, uh, today, I'll, I will be talking about uh, Ismaili Islam, uh, which some of you uh, may already know is part of the larger Shia tradition. Um, there are many types of Ismailis. Uh, I know on the Inside Islam series, uh, you recently had the Dawudi Bora community. There's actually also an Ismaili community. Uh, but today, I'll specifically be talking about uh, the Nizari Ismaili tradition. Um, and what does Nizari mean? What does Ismaili mean? What does Shia even mean? Those are also questions I'll be I'll be uh, answering for you today. Um, so I just want to set some goals and objectives. Um, you know, our goals and objectives today will be for me to help you uh, historically situate the Ismaili tradition uh, in history. Um, I'm going to discuss beliefs and practices as well. Uh, but more towards the end. Um, but the sort of deeper theological issues of, um, you know, uh, kalama law, speech of God, sifat, attributes of God, uh, eschatology, these sorts of things, you know, these can, be, these can be things that are sometimes quite hard to discuss, uh, especially since I think Ismaili theology has a lot of unique perspectives uh, on these issues. Um, though, of course, there are uh, a great many similarities with the great Sunni Sufi uh, falsifa uh, tradition, as well as with the 12-year Irfan tradition or mystical tradition. 
um, you know, doing justice to a lot of these these grand theological topics, um, you know, would turn this thirty minute talk into a, into a year long seminar, which uh, I don't think anybody here has has the time for. Um, but uh, if people have questions, uh, you know, theological questions like that, um, you know, inshallah, I'll do my I'll do my best to answer them. It's 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 what I study the most. So so uh, if you if you do have theological questions, they're definitely welcome. But it's not something I'll necessarily be focusing on uh, uh, in, during the presentation. Um, so we cannot really begin a talk on Shia Ismaili Muslims uh, without starting with the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Well, I know everyone here is probably quite familiar with, you know, with the stories and the character of the Prophet. One thing uh, that I think is, you know, uh, often forgotten or emphasized about him is the great authority and power, uh, specifically as an intermediary between you know the believers in God. You know this 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 specific role. Um, I think there are certain modern movements today uh, that like to downplay the role of the prophet. Uh, you know, deny his role as an intercessor. Um, but this is simply a reality, as recorded in 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 the Holy Quran. Um, you know, the prophet is often downplayed. I think uh, to a fax machine. You know, for God, who just delivered Arabic revelation. Uh, but anybody who has seriously studied the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet knows, right, this is this is simply not the case. He is not that. He's not somebody who just delivered Arabic revelation, right? He was he was much more. Um and I I cited some verses here for you, right? So you can see all these different roles that the Prophet played, right? Um he was not only responsible for delivering revelation, but he was responsible for teaching. And interpreting Kitab Allah, right? Um, he was responsible for our purification, right? There are verses in the Quran that talk about, right, in, in the ninth surah, where the Prophet is commanded to take sadaqah from us and purify us by means of it, um, right? The Prophet is also responsible for our guidance. The Prophet sends salawat, blessings upon our souls, that, and it gives us peace. That's what the Quran says. So, right, so there are many verses in the Quran that speak of the Prophet's act as an intermediary, right? And so this is very important uh, when you're trying to understand, uh, you know, the Shi'i tradition. Um, you know, uh, you know, there are other, there are lots of sort of other instances, um, and, and I think this is also important when you come to understand, right, the classical Sunni tradition as well. These are, you know, um, we share, I think especially when it comes to these verses, the interpretations, if you look at the tafsir, right? It's, we share uh, much of these interpretations, right? Uh, so for example, in Surah Nista and Surah 4, right? If we if we want to seek forgiveness from God, we're asked to come to the Prophet first and ask forgiveness. Uh, or, in, or in the 48th Surah of the Holy Quran, right? If we want to give allegiance to God, we're asked to give allegiance to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? Um, so for the Shia community, right, when you take all these verses into account, uh, the question of succession is not just a political issue, right? I think uh, the question of succession is often characterized as just a political dispute. This is really not the case, uh, right? Because the question now becomes, right, when you take these verses into account, who continues these specific roles of the prophet after his death, right? Who teaches Kitab Allah? Who's responsible for safeguarding the interpretation of Kitab Allah? Who receives our sadaqah and purifies us by means of it? If we want to give bayah allegiance to Allah, how who, you know who do we give bayah to? Right? How do we how do we do that? Right? Um, so, right, it is then the Shia and more so even the Ismaili understanding that. Human reason alone, being fallible, cannot give us right sound guidance. It cannot, um, uh, it cannot safeguard the interpretation of Kitab Allah, right? Because human reason is fallible. Humans are fallible. Um, <clears throat> humanity, then, right? For uh, for the Shia, humanity is believed to always be in need of an authority, an interpreter from God that can guide to the true meaning of Kitab Allah 
Prophetic Sunnah. Right, so it's in this context then that Shia Muslims believe that it was by divine decree or divine command that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, appointed his cousin and son-in-law, Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, to be his religious successor and to be the holder of spiritual authority. Right, uh, the authority and spiritual leadership or, or uh, imamat, as it's called, uh, continues in the lineage of these divinely ordained hereditary imams from Ali's progeny, okay? And so every imam is appointed uh, by the previous imam, and this, and this sort of designation is called nas. This is a very important term. Uh, and it the nas always goes back to the Prophet Muhammad's designation of imam Ali, right? So... Many of you know the imams after Ali. If you're familiar with, uh, with if you have friends who are Shia, then you may, might know, or if you've studied it, right? There's Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Imam Zain al Abidin, right? So all of them trace their nas, their designation to the previous imam, all the way back to the Prophet always. Okay, and the imams are said to possess a sacred ilm uh, or knowledge, or uh, sometimes, uh, right, even in the Sunni Sufi tradition. Uh, right, referred to as the Muhammadan light or the Muhammadan reality, right? This is something that is inherited from the prophets. And so the imams possess them. And this allows them to provide that correct, uh, that, that correct guidance uh, and to safeguard, right, the traditions of the prophet the, the, in the true meaning of Kitab Allah. Now, I realize this might, some of these beliefs might sound strange uh, to many. Um, uh, but this is based on an understanding of historical events that um, Sunnis and Shias agree upon, um, right? So I think oftentimes we find, right, Sunnis and Shias agree on a lot of historical events, what happened in the early period, but there's simply a disagreement about the interpretation of these events, right? Um, and, you know, so one of the reasons why, you know, Shias believe, right, that Imam Ali was appointed and designated, right? One of the major reasons is simply the biographical information of Imam Ali. And I've listed some of the things here. I, I don't want to take too much time going over them. Um, but, you know, again, Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims agree these things happened. Um, but there's simply disagreement on their interpretation, right? What exactly do these things mean? And the best example of this that I'm sure many people are familiar with is the hadith at gadir Qum, right? This is a tradition that is narrated by over 110 companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, right? Again, Sunnis and Shias agree that this tradition was said. This is, this is a well-attested to uh, narration. Um, we just disagree as to what it means, right? So the word mola, right? That is the contentious word here. Does it mean master? Does it mean friend, companion? Um, was Ali, was the prophet simply trying to recover the image of, of Imam Ali, you know, um, because he, you know, he messed up recently or, or was this a divine designation from Allah, right? So again, there's a disagreement as to the interpretation, but I think something that sort of cannot be disagreed upon is that, uh, or something that is sort of objective and absolute is the fact that this is not just a political dispute, okay? Um, right, the idea, the idea that this succession was something uh, purely political it is just, it's just no longer true, right? Even scholars uh, in the Western Academy, right? Academic, non-Muslim scholars in the Western uh, Academy show that, right? This was this was something that was religious, right? Uh, Maria Dukake writes, um, Right. There is much literary evidence to support the idea that Ali represented for many of them, many of the supporters, an absolute and divinely guided leader. Right. Um, so the point here just being that, right, again, this is this is not a political dispute. Right. So this was there are there's sort of a lot of religious spiritual stakes. Right. In, in, in who succeeds the prophet. And what this means now. I think there are also, right, Shias will also often turn to the Quran for this understanding of imamah or spiritual authority, right? 
right? Because God tells us in the Quran that he appoints imams for mankind. So if you, I won't read these verses for you, um, uh, but right in the first two, right? Uh, Abraham is appointed as an imam for mankind, Abraham, his son Isaac, and then his son Jacob, right? You see lineal descent there. They're appointed as a'ima, imams, um, right? So there's this idea already in the Quran about there being imams, right, uh, that are appointed by God. Um, and also one thing that we see in the Quran is throughout the Quran, the successor of a prophet is almost is always a family member of the prophet, right, with with Moses, it's Aaron, um, right, who is his brother. Um, there's, you know, there's this idea of the Ulul Amr, right, uh, the possessors of authority, right? They're supposed to be, uh, the Ulul Amr are supposed to be obeyed alongside God and the Prophet, and, and so on and so forth. You have all these sorts of things in the Quran, right? And, and the point here is I'm not trying to prove anything to you. I'm simply trying to show that there is a basis. There there are good reasons, Um you know, why so many Muslims today identify with Shia. And, you know, there's a basis for why Shia Muslims historically have understood authority this way. It's not something that just comes out of thin air, right? So there is just, I, all I want to show, all I want to convey here is that there is a basis for it. Um, again, there's tons of disagreements uh, as to the interpretation of these verses and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and there will always be disagreements, but nevertheless, right, um, this is this is what Shi'is will traditionally rely upon, right? And this is just a sample, right? Uh, obviously, there's much more. It is a, it's a huge intellectual tradition, philosophical, theological tradition. Um, uh, right now that we have established why Shi'as believe in imamat, spirit, the spiritual authority, and, and in the designation of the I, I want to now try situating uh, the different Shia communities and why division happens, why there are so many Shia communities, right? So. You've already heard from the Dawudiboras. Your, I think, the first theory, lecture in this series was from uh, from a twelver Shia alim, right? Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of different Daibi Ismaili communities. There's also the Zaydi Shia, right? So um, there's <laughs> lots of lots of different Shia communities. Um, I'm going to point out some of the major divisions, um, some of the more relevant ones. I won't point out all of them. Um, but I think it's important to note that just a historical note for all of you, um, is that at least on the next two slides that I show you, um, um, there were schisms, uh, basically after the death of each of these imams. Okay. Um, most of these communities though, however, uh, you know, just end up being, you know, becoming extinct. Some of them due to, you know, just being massacred. Um, unfortunately, um, by the ruling authorities and other times they just simply become, you know, due to various historical reasons. Um, all right. So after Imam Ali, right, generally, uh, most Shia say that Imam Hassan and Hussein succeeded him. And then, you know, you're generally okay after Imam Zain al-Abidin, there's the Zaydi Shia split. Um, the Zaydi Shia are still present today in, in Yemen primarily. Um, but then it, it is after the death of the sixth Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq, there is a significant schism um, between the communities that become known as the Ismailis and the community that becomes, uh, uh, that comes to be known as the Twelvers, right? And they're, they're, they're called Twelvers because they follow only 12 Imams, right? Um, Ismailis uphold that the lineage of Imams uh, should be traced through the original heir designate of, uh, who is uh, Imam, right? For us, Imam Ismail ibn Jafar, Ismail, Ismail, we get our name from uh, Ismail because we follow Ismail ibn Jafar. Uh, whereas Twelvers believe that the Imam after Jafar Sadiq was Musa ibn Jafar. Um, now, uh, so during this early period, right, um, you have the Shia community, uh, right, that crystallizes quite early. Um, and as you're all probably familiar, right, there's lots of conflict with the ruling caliphate. So for those uh, of you who know your history, right, Imam ja when Imam Jafar Sadiq passes away, this is shortly after the Abbasid Revolution, right, in 750, and the Umayyads are sort of, you know, uh, gone um, in, in Spain, and um, uh, the Abbasids are now ruling, right? Um, but before this, right, um, 
you know, the Umayyads, starting with Mawia, were very hostile to the Shi'i imams uh, and their supporters, right? Because it was actually quite routine uh, for them to condemn and persecute the family of the Prophet. You know, the, the family was routinely cursed from the pulpit. Um, and this had obvious con- consequences, right? Everybody's familiar with Karbala, right? The massacre of uh, Imam Hussein, uh, the Prophet's grandson, uh, and, and many members of, uh, of his family, right? So this was a very contentious period, okay? Um, this is also partly why you see so many schisms, right? Again, there's is a very con- the early period was very contentious. Um, there's a lot of good academic scholarship I can point you to on the matter, um, but you know, let's let's go ahead and move on for the sake of time. Um, Sorry. Uh, uh, but yeah. Uh, now, when it comes to the imams of the Twelver Shia, right, uh, many, in, as you might remember, if you were in part of uh, the first Inside Islam lecture, right, many of them uh, lived their lives in a, they were, uh, in Abbasid prisons. They were imprisoned, they were killed and assassinated by the Abbasids. Um, Right, the the twelfth imam of the Twelvers, uh, the son of Al Askari, uh, goes into uh, Ghaiba or occultation. So the Twelver Shia believe that uh, their twelfth imam is in occultation. So the Twelver community today actually refers to this imam as Hazir, as present. So he's present for them. Okay, he's not visible, but he's present. He is the present imam for them. Um, right, but for the Ismailis, it's different. Okay, for the Ismailis, the lineage of imams continue in the line of Ismail ibn Jafar, uh, and the Ismaili imams eventually um, uh, gain power uh, through reading uh, numerous revolts uh, in North Africa, and that starts, and then you have the beginnings of the Fatimid Caliphate, which is right the only Shia Caliphate uh, in, in history. Um, so now the Caliphs of the Fatimids were all Ismaili imams, okay? Um, the Fatimid Caliphate, though, um, was quite unique uh, and different uh, from the Abbasid and Umayyad Caliphates because the Fatimids, unlike the Abbasids and the Umayyads, the Fatimids were ruling over a majority people that were not the same faith as them. Right? One can say maybe the early Umayyads were like this too, um, but it's quite different in the 10th and 11th century when, you know, most of the area is now you know, there's many more Muslims. Um, so, right, you had the Fatimid Ismaili Imam Caliphs ruling over a Sunni majority, okay? And so, um, the Fatimids understood the reality of this. Um, and in the way they governed, right, they uh, practiced sort of, they practiced a pluralism that was quite sort of I would say radical, something that the Islamic world had not seen before. So the Fatimids are actually um, the first Muslim government we know of, that we have, um, to recognize opposing schools of thought as legitimate schools, legitimate uh, legal schools. So, for example, the Fatimids recognized the, the four Sunni uh, madhabs, uh, the Hanafi, Shafi'i, Hanbali, Maliki schools of thought as legitimate. They even appointed qadis in these schools, right? They were non-Ismailis, but they appointed qadis in these schools, right? Um, and and this is a very, this is a very sort of interesting part of Islamic history. Um, and it is because, right? This is, um, you know, you have this idea in in, in Sunni Islam, um, uh, you know, this idea of the equality of the madhabs, right? The equality of the Hanafi school. Right, the, Hanif, the, the four schools, the Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali school, are all seen as part of the a tradition of the Ahl al-Sunnah. They are all considered orthodox, right? But this equality of the four madhabs um, is, comes about as a top-down imposition from the Mamluks, who were the ruling empire after the Fatimids fall in 1171, right? And this happens in 1256, uh, when the Mamluk sultan appointed four chief qadis, one from each school. Um, so this idea of four chief qadis actually comes, though, from the way the Shia Ismaili Fatimids rule, right? Because the Shia Ismaili Fatimids were the first ones to implement this sort of legal pluralist model in their reign by appointing Sunni and Ismaili chief qadis, right? 
Uh, because in, in the Fatimid Caliphate, there is no idea, right? And you can read this Amman document here, right? This Amman declaration I have on the screen. Um, and this is as recorded by a Sunni historian, al Makrizi, right? So there's no sort of, you know, not a, no, no tampering. Uh, maybe there was, uh, but uh, but this is as recorded by a Sunni historian. So, you know, you know uh, it's, it's probably good. It's probably uh, accurate. Uh, this is what the actual Amman declaration said. Um, but right. So this was the first instance, this legal pluralist model and this idea, right. There's this verse in the Quran that we also know of, right. Uh, there is no compulsion in religion, right. But, and this was actually, this verse was sort of one of the inspiring, was one of the inspirations for the Fatimid rule, right. No forced conversions, nothing like that. Let's appoint Qadis from different schools. Um, let's not force people to follow the Ismaili school. And there is a great article by Patricia Krona, you know, who's a great scholar of Islamic history, where she also shows, she surveys multiple tafsir of, of this period. And it is only the Ismaili Fatimids of this time who actually understand the verse like this. Many other tafsir say that this verse was abrogated or they simply don't understand this verse in the pluralistic way that the Fatimids did, right? So... My point here is that it is the Fatimids were quite radical in the way they governed and quite radical in the way they, you know, uh, established relationships uh, with the other schools of in Islam, seeing them as legitimate alternative schools, right? Not as heresies, not not as heretics, but as fellow Muslims who have, you know, just different interpretations, right? So it was quite, quite, quite a radical idea for the time. Um, Maybe some might say a radical idea for even this time. Um, now, uh, I think, right, although the Fatimids uh, practiced this pluralism in their government and the way they ruled uh, and interacted with the populace, right, I think it's important to note that Ismailis in other areas, um, also after the Fatimids, were, were, were right, quite regularly massacred. We have uh, multiple recordings in primary sources of Ismailis being burned alive, you know, skinned alive, hor horrifically tortured. Right, even the famous Sufi uh, mystic and thinker, the Ashari Kalam theologian of Ghazali, called for the Ismailis to be slaughtered. Um, uh, I mean, I think the the point all I'm trying to show here is that, and again, not everybody thought this way, but right, these were the towering figures of the time. Ghazali especially, right? I mean, the point is to simply show how unique uh, the, Fatimid, the Fatimid governance was, right, when you compare it to rival Muslim polities. Uh, I think it was, you know, um, so it is something that's that that's truly, that should be made note of. Um, and it's not to say that there are no examples of pluralism in, in Abbasid rule um, or, or anything like that, but I think this is, you know, the Fatimids did something very unique. Uh, in the way they governed. Um, um, and so now we come to the next schism. Uh, uh, and this is the last major schism we'll talk about. Uh, but this is the schism uh, uh, between what is generally understood as the Tayyabi Ismaili communities and the Nizari Ismaili communities, right? So the Tayyabi Ismailis, um, those are like the Dawudi Boras. They are they, um, you know, in their presentation, they talked about how they follow the Fatimi Ismaili Tayyabi school of thought, right? Um, so after the death of the 18th Ismaili Imam, Mustansar Bala in 1094, uh, the Ismailis follow the original heir designate, uh, Nizar, where the Tayyabis trace their Imam through a different son of Mustansar Bala. And for the Tayyabis, the 21st Imam, and I've noted him on the screen here, um, uh, the 21st Imam goes into concealment, not Ghaiba, not occultation, concealment, Sathar. Uh, and it is believed by all of the Bora communities, the various Bayabi communities, that the Imamate's succession continues. So that they so all these Tayyabi communities, they have a present Imam today, but that this Imam is simply in hiding. So not visible, but present, present on earth. Uh and they are represented by an absolute missionary or a dial mutlaq. Uh, I think the current uh, dial mutlaq of the Daudi Bora community is Sayyidina Saifuddin. Um, might be wrong. Um, 
but you know they have a current dial mufluk, um, and uh, and there's many dial mufluks for the different Bora communities. Now, again, for the Nizarius smileys, uh, the imamat continues, right? It's different. There is no dial mutlaq. The imamat continues. So while there is a minor split that occurs after the 28th imam, just thought I would note that, uh, you know, that lineage, the Muhammad Shahi lineage eventually comes to an end and they all come back to the Nizari Ismailis and they give their baya, their allegiance to the 48th Ismaili imam, uh, Sultan Muhammad Shah Aga Khan III. Uh, and so in today, in the current period, we are living during the imamat of the 49th uh, Shia Ismaili Imam Shah Karim Al Husseini Aga Khan IV. Um, and I, I would like to just spend uh, the next few minutes going over specifically these two Imams, uh, Aga Khan III and Aga Khan IV, uh, because they've had quite uh, quite the impact uh, on the history, on the modern history of the world, and not just for Ismailis, but for all Muslims. Um, and I and I and I think they serve, you know, and and I and what they've done, um, you know, shows sort of how the Ismaili Imams into the present day have sort of continued this Fatima tradition of pluralism and compassion towards others, regardless of creed. Um, so the 48th uh, Ismaili Imam, Sultan Muhammad Shah, born in 1877. He becomes the imam actually at the age of eight, so very young. Um, his father, the 47th imam, was imam for only four years. Um, so, right, the 48th Ismaili imam, as maybe uh, some of you are know, if any of you are uh, familiar with the history of modern South Asia, uh, the 48th Ismaili imam plays a large role in the independence movements of India and Pakistan. Uh, and work to secure the rights of you know all Muslims in South Asia and in, and beyond. Even so much so after the end of World War One, right? He pleaded with the Western countries to 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 save the Ottoman Sunni Caliphate. But we can talk more about that later. Um, right? He was the found he was the founder and president of the All India Muslim League, um, and even became president of the League of Nations, which was the precursor to the United Nations in 1937. Um, he was probably the only. A uh, modernist Muslim thinker in the 20th century South Asia who fought for women's education because he believed that they should not be economically dependent on marriage. They should have the power to direct their own lives and obtain personal happiness. Now, this is not to say that there were other, there were not other Muslim modernist thinkers who also did not fight for women's education, right? We know people like Nazar Ahmad, Mumtaz Ali, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, Ashraf Ali Thanawi, right? These were also big time modernist thinkers uh, in South Asia, you know, who argued, again, for improving uh, Muslim women's education. But if you read their works, right, they argue for Muslim women's education for the purpose of the women to better manage the household uh, so she can educate the children, so she can be a better companion uh, to her husband, right? not necessarily for her own happiness, her own welfare, her own independence, right? Um, so Aga Khan III writes uh, in, in, in his book, India and in Transition, the constant argument has been that of the necessity for providing educated and intelligent wives and daughters, sisters and mothers for the men. The time has come for a full recognition that the happiness and welfare of the women themselves must be the end and purpose of all efforts towards improvement. So Sultan Muhammad Shah, like the Fatimids, right, was sort of uh, become is becomes a radical example of model Muslim leadership, right? It was sort of very unique uh, amongst the rest of the modernist Muslim uh, thinkers in South Asia for, for this perspective. Um, and again, right, Sultan Muhammad Shah is not just he's not even fighting for majority Ismailis, right? He's fighting for all Muslims here, um, right? He Throughout history, actively fought for the rights and welfare of all Muslims. In the 1910s, he successfully worked to get Indian Muslims separate electorates. Again, as I mentioned before, even endeavored to preserve the Sunni Ottoman Caliphate, right? Because he understood or in Sunni Islam, right? The Caliphate is the center of Sunni Muslim authority. So he fought to preserve it, right? Again, right? This is a very, this is, you know, it, some might say very interesting given that, right? This caliphate also was responsible for killing many thousands of Ismailis. Yet, right, this 
it does not matter, right? It's about the welfare of all Muslims today, right? Um, and he even tries, right, to reconcile Shia and Sunni understandings of early history by stating that Ismailis accept the caliphate of the first caliphs like Abu Bakr and Umar, uh, and that Ismailis do not see them as political usurpers. We accept their political authority. Of course, we maintain that spiritual authority continues with the imams, but we accept the political authority of Abu Bakr, Umar, and we, you know, we believe that they further the cause of the Muslims, um, right? And you will never ever see an Ismaili cursing any of the Sahaba. It is, it, you know, explicitly forbidden uh, for us to do anything like that. So you never ever see that, right? We 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 celebrate the Sahaba. You'll see an Ismaili religious education textbooks. You know, refer to Abu Bakr as Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Omar, right? So we give them the Sahaba, the utmost respect. Um, and now, uh, you know, as we move to the uh, present day with the current Imam, Aga Khan IV. Um, so Aga Khan IV, as I've already say, stated, is the 49th and present Ismaili Imam. He became the Imam at the age of 20 while he was a student at Harvard. Um, now, the Ismaili Imam currently runs the largest private NGO in the world. Um, it doesn't serve even a uh, majority of Ismailis. It serves mainly non-Ismailis. It, its aim is to really to serve all people. There's no sort of missionizing work or dawa work that's tied to it. Um, you won't. There's no sort of religious education component to the AKDN. It is uh, an organization that simply seeks to improve the quality of life of, of, of all people. Um, and I think one thing to, that's important to note here is that the imams do not see their work as charity or philanthropy. These are not good words. We don't like these words, charity and philanthropy. Um, the AKDN and the work of the Ismaili imams flows from their very mandate of imama, from their role as imams of mankind. And so it is by divine command that they seek to implement true Islamic justice in the world. Okay, It is part of their role as imam to do these things. It is not some sort of philanthropy charity that they do on the side. This is their job to take care of the world, to establish justice in accordance with the Holy Quran and the Sunnah. Right? This is their job. This is their role. Um, and, you know, the... Aga Khans for their work, you know, are recognized all over the world for their work by Muslim governments as well, uh, by non-Muslim governments. You will often see pictures of the Aga Khan uh, meeting with various heads of state, whether it be the heads of state of Afghanistan, Pakistan, UAE, Syria, France, regardless. Um, I know some of us, uh, you know, including me, uh, you know, don't like the, the head of states of of some of these countries, some of them are not great people who do some very bad things, but you have to remember uh, mainly the people they govern are just innocent Muslims, right? And so, you know, the imam is sort of forced to work uh, with some, uh, you know, uh, work with these people at the end of the day, if he is to improve the quality of life of, of, of the people who live in those countries, right? Um, so, you know, on the right side, you can see all of, all of the sort of uh, various designations and recognitions that the current imam has received, right? So um, this is all very well documented. You can look this up. It, it, this is honestly, this is an old count. This might be even more, but um, um, uh, but now I just let's just focus. Let's go to the AKDN and we can look at sort of the impact that AKDN has had on the world. Um, and so when it comes to the AKDN and, and it being part of the mandate, of the imamat again not philanthropy right not a good not not a word uh like uh but it's part of the mandate of the imamat the imam has stated that the ethics of islam guide all my activity right and we can see this in the results of of of, all, of akdn right again akdn is a private ngo right and it has over a billion dollars uh, uh in annual expenditures for its nonprofit development um you can see just in the last year the amount right they served you know, millions of people uh, in their hospitals, again, mostly non-Ismaili, um, like, you know, almost completely non-Ismaili, actually. Um, uh, 
you know, um, helps provide safe water to people, generates ele clean electricity for people, provided financial service to over 50 million people, right? This is just in the last year, but you look at the greater impact, right? The Aga Khan Trust for Culture, for example, works on restoring monuments, um, works on um, creating parks, various historical conservation projects, but not just for Ismaili monuments. Actually, the majority of it's not even Ismaili. For uh, monuments of various caliphates, various Muslim empires, some of which were some of some of which were you know very hostile to Shias, right? So they're working on restoring the walled city in Lahore. They worked on Humayun's tomb in New Delhi, a Mughal emperor, uh, the Blue Mosque in Cairo, um, gardens in Kabul, the Al Azhar Park in 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 Cairo, the Al Azhar Park. There's no there's no Ismailis in Egypt. Like no Nizarius money in Egypt. Maybe there's one or two, you know, uh, maybe they live there for work or something, but there's no like Jamaf kind of there, right? So, but the Imam built Al Azhar Park, which is the largest green space in, in Egypt. Um, the Citadel of Aleppo, right? Uh, various mosques in Mali. There are also no Ismaili communities in Mali, yet the Imam has worked tirelessly to restore and renovate and conserve all of these great historical mosques in Mali, right? So, again, it, it, this idea of oh Ismaili versus non Ismaili, this is just not a lens the Imam sees through when he does his work. He doesn't see through this lens of non Ismaili. He just sees through the lens of yeah humanity. Okay, um, right. And again, you know, over two hundred health centers uh, created five power plants that serve power to clean energy to ten million uh, people. Um, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, which has been around for a while now, is generally regarded as the most prized, most uh, prestigious award in the world of architecture today. Uh, the Aga Khan University is the most prestigious medical school in South, all of South Asia, right? 35% um, of degree issuing nursing schools in Pakistan are headed by AKU graduates. Seven AKU graduates are chief nurses of hospitals. Uh, the Aga Khan Museum. Um, is the first Islamic art museum built in the Western world. Um, so one might, you know, I mean, I, it's just, you know, the imam is, um, and again, it's not a, it's an Islamic art museum. It's not in, it doesn't just showcase it, stuff from, you know, monuments or, or historic or, uh, you know, uh, manuscripts or, or artifacts from Ismaili history, but old Muslim history, right? So the imam's work is dedicated to not just glorifying you know, Ismaili history, but the good parts of all of Muslim history, right? It's about, it's about uh, restoring that, restoring all of Muslim tradition, um, right? Not just, not just uh, the Ismailis. Um, okay, so enough history and that stuff we can talk about. Just uh, almost done here. Sorry if I'm going over. Um, we'll just We'll just quickly quickly talk about the Rika uh, or uh, ritual practice. Um, so, when we talk about the Ismaili community today, the Ismailis define themselves as a Tariqa of Islam. So, this word Tariqa is very much used in the same way as it is in the Sunni tradition. Okay, the Tariqa or path uh, represents the more esoteric dimensions of Islam, and it and it comes with, of course, right extra practices on top of traditional Sharia practices, right? So the Tariqa practices, of course, are in accordance with the Sharia, but are seen as sort of the esoteric dimension of the Sharia, an evolution of it, if you will. So while many Ismailis participate in Sharia rituals like Eid prayers, funeral rites, Ramadan fasting, all the good stuff, uh, many of the main Ismaili practices, the ones that are specific to the Ismailis, are defined as Tariqa practices. Um, so here are some examples, right? So like in Sunni in classical Sunni Sufi tariqas, you have to give allegiance, baya, to the sheikh to be able to access his teachings and participate. Um, similarly, in the Nizari Ismaili tariqa, uh, one must give baya to the imam to have access, right, to the Jamaat kind of prayer space and his teachings. Um, Ismailis, like all Muslims, have a, a daily Arabic prayer that includes Quranic recitation, a sujood prostration, but also includes, right, for us, attestation to the living imam. Um, Ismailis also practice intercessory prayers. So maybe you're familiar with terms like tawasul and istigata, uh, the practice of seeking blessings through the prophet and imams. This is 
very similar uh, to mainstream Sunni Sufi practices of seeking help and blessings through the prophet and, and the awliya or saints, right? These ideas of tawassul uh, and intercession or, or intercession are, I mean, they're mainstream in classical Sunni Islam, right? There are, of course, uh, modern movements today that have sought to uh, takfir the majority of Muslims over this issue. Uh, but it is simply, everyone, a historical reality that the ijma of the Sunni ulema on tawassul is that it is permissible and even beneficial. That is the ijma, right? And there's plenty of classical uh, texts in every single Muslim tradition that attest to this, right? But, you know, so uh, the only reason I say this is because I know intercession today is a hot topic. Um, so, you know, though Muslims might disagree who we can do tawassul through, um, nevertheless, right, it stands that this is a mainstream Muslim practice and has been for the last 1400 years. We even have inscriptions of people doing tawassul to, through the prophet that date to like the year like 70 or 80 um, after Hijra, right? So very, it's a very early practice. Um, there's also the practice of zakat, right? Uh, Qums or the son, uh, where Ismaili submit 10 to 12.5% of their income to the imam as means of spiritual pur purification, right? This is something we discussed already, um, right? This is a verse in, in, in the Quran, in, in the ninth surah. Um, and on the note of zakat, um, you know, this, this leads us into, um, we can talk about the larger spiritual role of the imam. So the imam, as we mentioned before, uh, he continues the spiritual, religious, and intercessory roles of the prophet, which the prophet had performed in his own lifetime. Now, the imam does not perform revelation. The imam does not give new revelation. No, 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 right? The prophet performs tanzil, bringing down, composing the revelation, and the imams perform ta'wil, the interpretation of the revelation. So, um, right, Ismailis must obey the imam. He has absolute authority over the Ismailis. And the imam will deliver what we call firman, or faramin, the, the plural. It's a Persian word, uh, meaning command or edict, uh, which oftentimes contain various rulings and guidance from the imam that is binding upon every Ismaili. It is, it is binding. Um, the imam interprets religious practices of the community, right? All practices in the jamaat cannot have to be authorized by the imam. Again, we practice tawassul or intercession through the living imam in our daily prayers. We ask for the imam's blessings and we seek forgiveness of God through the imam. Um, again, and I already mentioned this idea of the Muhammadan light. Um, again, it's an idea that is in mainstream classical Sunni Islam. If you've ever read any academic text on Sufism or, um, you know, um, uh, Sunni mystics, even Ghazali, anything like that, you will know this idea is very familiar, very common, mainstream. Um, the Muhammadan light or reality is something that represents the spiritual essence of the prophet, right? And is this light that the imams possess. Um, uh, lastly, last thing, last slide, I promise. Um, uh, we can talk about a smiley ritual practice. Uh, and a smiley ritual practice happens inside a space called the Jamaat Fana. Uh, it is where Ismaili prayers occur every single day. Again, these are private spaces. Uh, the prayer space is restricted to Ismailis who have given bayah to the Ismaili Imam. Again, this is very much in the tradition of a Sufi tariqa, uh, you know, uh, where uh, Sufi tariqa rituals and practices oftentimes take place in spaces beyond the masjid. Uh, during prayers, uh, the, gen uh, the prayer hall is gender segregated. Uh, so men sit on one side, women sit on the other, but adjacent, not behind one another. Um, but free mixing is allowed uh, after prayers have concluded. Uh, the Jamaatkan is also have social halls because um, it's meant to be a space where the community can come together. Um, so lots of community events are hosted. Religious education classes happen inside the Jamaatkana. Certain Jamaatkanas, like uh, especially the Ismaili centers, which are packed. So the one on the left is the Ismaili center in Toronto. The one on the right is the Ismaili center in Tajikistan, I think in Khorog. Um, and um, many of these host interfaith and even intrafaith events. So it's 
It's very common for scholars from other Muslim communities to come and speak uh, several times, actually. The Ismaili Center of Toronto has hosted 12 years Shia ulema to come speak on like Milad and Nabi, for example, the, the birth of the Prophet. Um, so, you know, there's still very much this tradition of you know, pluralism that is practiced in, in the community today. Um, but I, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and stop there um, and we'll, we'll, we'll call it. Sorry, I, I don't know how much time I took. Hopefully it wasn't. Hopefully it was. Okay. <laughs> You're all good, Ali John. Thank you so much um, for you know such a insightful uh, presentation. I got a number of questions that have been coming in throughout uh, the presentation. So, inshallah, I think um, what what might not have been able to be covered. I, I imagine this is not your last slide. I imagine you have some uh, some other stuff after as well. But um, I imagine what might not have been able to be covered yeah. hopefully can be uh, brought out through uh, some of the questions. But uh, just a reminder for everybody here, um, please uh, again, you are most welcome to. Uh, send your questions through the chat. Uh, you can drop them in the chat or you can message them to me. Um, and again, um, you know, really appreciate you, uh, Brother John, for such a thorough um, run through of not just uh, Ismaili practice and, and the faith and uh, tradition, but also the history and, and kind of giving us the fuller context and connecting the dots with respect to other sessions uh, with respect to the uh, 12 Shia um, and the Daudi Bora um, sessions that we've had. So appreciate that. Um, but we can go ahead and jump into the questions if that's all right with you. Um, and again, for everybody, please just uh, use the chat as you'd like here. Uh, the first question that um, we've got here is uh, in Ismaili communities, uh, is there if if the imam is uh, imam the Hazar imam imam Aga Khan, um, what what if any are there uh, you know local imams or local prayer leaders similar to how you have the imam of a mosque here or you have uh, a alim um, at a, a mosque or a sheikh? Uh, do you have something similar for uh, Ismaili Jamaat Khan as or Ismaili communities? Uh, yeah. Sort of. Um, so oftentimes, right, so you, um, I believe this is correct, but, you know, for the longest time, right, to give you some context, right, in Shia communities, right, you always need the imam to authorize the prayer. So for like the longest time, the Jummah prayer was not recited in the 12 or Shia community after the Raiva, right, because there was no, uh, there was no imam present to honor, visible imam, right? Um, so the imam appoints ceremonial representatives uh, to each um, to each jamaat khana, and so usually a volunteer from the congregation will simply sit and recite the prayer. There is no like dedicated imam that recites the prayer every day, but there is a dedicated ceremonial representative that sits um, to authorize the prayer on behalf of the imam so like ceremonially he represents the imam because he's been given authority of the by the imam to authorize the prayer um and so and so and so but the person who actually recites the prayer that can be sort of changes every day um, um anybody can recite the prayer men women um but it the the, the what is referred to in the south asian tradition as, as the muki usually the um he is a ceremonial representative and he, you know, he's the person that is sort of like maybe the imam, if you will. He has to, he is the ceremony. He has to be there to authorize the prayer. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, and another question we had that came in was uh, if we want to learn more about Ismaili theology, um, do you have a recommendation on where to start on doing that? Uh, yeah, yeah. If you want to learn about um, Ismaili theology, you can, um, there is actually, a, oh, I can't believe I didn't mention this. Uh, there's actually an institute for Ismaili studies. It, it's mainly, they mainly publish academic work, but they just started publishing very, um, you know, work that, that is not just to be consumed by graduate students. Uh, because a lot of the work that they have produced is, is some, can be somewhat complex, but they produce a lot of primary, like, translations of primary texts. Um, so if you want to learn more about Ismaili theology, I would recommend looking at the publications of the Institute of Ismaili Studies. Um, uh, there are also a great many uh, uh, thinkers, uh, Ismaili, uh, Ismaili academics who, who, who do work in this space. Uh, if you go on YouTube, um, 
and you look up somebody named uh, Khalil Andani. He is a professor at Augustana College, did his PhD at Harvard. His focus is, is in Ismaili intellectual history. So he has a lot of academic videos, academic, like they're academic, right? Um, but nevertheless, they're good, good. They'll give you a nice starter. You know, he always cites all the sources so you can see what text maybe you want to refer to. Um, but yeah, I'd recommend those. Sure. And uh, definitely as a, a note for attendees here, uh, we'll send like a recap email and we'll definitely include any links. So uh, Ali John as well, any any links that you see or any institutes, things like that, feel free to send them to me and I'll, I'll definitely pass them along to uh, yeah. audience members here. Um, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. The next uh, question we've gotten was on uh, the, uh, the tariqa practices uh, or the ibadah. Um, that you had lifted up. Uh, are these, the question was, uh, are these tariqa practices mandatory? Um, and a uh, kind of pin question to that as well is that, uh, are there any pillars uh, within uh, Ismaili Islam? Um, and are these uh, permanent uh, practices like the tariqa practices, uh, are they kind of uh, fixed or are these kind of at the discretion of the imam, if any? Yeah. Yeah. Uh Excellent question. So the Tariqa practices are all mandatory. Yes, they're mandatory. Um, the uh, so so they're all mandatory. Are they fixed? So, for example, right, the current Arabic prayer, which we refer to as the Dua, the for the Tariqa practice is the Dua, has like we recite eighteen rakats of it. Every day, every Ismail is required to do that, uh, like units of prayer, right? Rikots. Um Now, it used to be the case where, you know, uh, the Tariqa prayer used to be like, like 50 units of prayer a day, like back like a century ago, right? But this imam changed it. So the Tariqa practices are, right, can be changed, can be modified. Um, uh, in terms of pillars of Islam, yeah, um, we have the same pillars as everybody else. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Yeah. So like the Ramadan fasting, pilgrimage, shahada, right? Pilgrimage are the same. Definitely. Um, I think this, this question actually, uh, was related to that, that, uh, it is, uh, dua, uh, or the daily prayer, um, in Ismaili practice and understanding the same as, uh, what is understood by Salah or what is kind of in, commanded by the Quran of Salah, um, and as interpreted by other, uh, Muslim communities. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly correct, right? So for us, Salah takes the uh, manifests as as the du'a today, right? Um, yeah, that's correct. So um, I've got uh, I see a question that was put in the chat uh, by uh, Brother Chance. Um, I don't know if it may have been should or could, but should a Muslim practice both Sunni and Shia traditions? I think that might be at uh, your prerogative, but um, maybe be building off of that, it, it could. Theoretically, a Muslim practice both um, Sunni, uh, you know, Orthodox uh, Islam practices yeah. in a way, as well as if it was uh, in this case uh, Ismaili Shia Ismailism, or if it was uh, you know any other kind of uh, tradition within Shia Islam. Yeah, I, I think. Look, I, I think when you go, if you go online, right, and you look up different polemical videos, it will make it look like. There are so much difference between all of these traditions, okay? And, um, you know, right, if you look at, so for example, right, like, if you look at Ibn Arabi, for example, right, um, Ibn Arabi was a Sunni mystic, right? Um, but there's sort of no denying that he had lots of Neoplatonic ideas, and if you read Michael Epstein's uh, work on this, not Epstein, Epstein, uh, just Eb, e -B, uh, he has a book where he sort of shows that, uh, and again, he's a professor, he's an academic scholar, where many of Ibn Arabi's Neoplatonic ideas will, you know, they come from um, uh, Ismaili thinkers like Jafar ibn Mansur al-Yaman, and he shows this, right, through, through very close textual analysis, right? So... I mean, you know, or if you look at, for example, right, if, you know, I've been mentioning a certain modern phenomena, I think everybody knows I'm talking about Salafism. Um, but if you look at right there, 
Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, right? Um, he has a text uh, called, um, you know, um, uh, basically like, uh, it's like called the, uh, the Annihilation of the Fire. I, I'm forgetting the exact Arabic name of the text, but in the text, he espouses a view of universal salvation, okay? Ibn Taymiyyah was no fan of Ibn Arabi, but where do you think he got this idea from? He got it from Ibn Arabi, right? So I think when we talk about, you know, um, oftentimes thinkers will dissociate from each other, but they're so much closer than we realize. Like, sorry, one more example. We take Al-Ghazali, for example, right? Ghazali has a text called the Mishkat al-Anwar, right? Uh, the niche of lights, where, I mean, he is taking stuff from Nasr Khosro, who was an Ismaili, his text, the Vajidin, right? His cosmology, for example, is very Ismaili. Uh, it's very Neoplatonic, right? But Ghazali is also celebrated as a Orthodox Ashari Kalam theologian and an Orthodox Sufi, right? So, I mean, if you follow, if you read the Mishkat or if you read Ibn Arabi and you like the Neoplatonist stuff, are you are you are you practicing the Ismaili Tariqa then? They got it from Ismailis. I, I mean, I, I think it's you know when we say practicing a Sunni, it's, it, the lines are so much more more blurred between thinkers. I think than we realize, uh, given how much they took from each other. Now, do I think? But I, I'm also like not a relativist, right? So like I don't think you can be an Orthodox Sunni and then affirm the legitimacy of Aga Khan the Fourth. That doesn't sort of like make sense, you know. Um, if you like to do um, some sort of Sunni dhikr um, and you're an Ismaili and you gave it your allegiance, I mean, that's fine. No, that's fine. Or if you are, um, you know, I, I would say like it's, you know, I, it's such a, such a, it's a hard question to answer just because I think studying the traditions as a, as a, as an academic, it, it sort of really shows that there's a lot of blurred lines um, but we also don't want to be relativists about it, right? There are also very clear-cut differences, but when it comes to theology and these sorts of things, like it's sort of uh, it's uh, the differences sort of can become blurred sometimes. I think. Yeah, yeah for sure. Thanks so much for for um, the response, um, uh, Aliza. I really appreciate that and and the historical insight to that as well to show the nuance. Um, uh, we've got a couple of the questions. We'll, we'll cap it at those questions that, that uh, were yeah. sent in here. Um, but of course, we'll plug y'all in to uh, and connect y'all with uh, Brother Ali John, if that's all right, to uh, have for further que a conversation for the questions that might come up. Um, but uh, the uh, questions that are here, I think, allude to a question I was going to have on general misconceptions about the Ismaili community. And so that that uh, yeah, I'll, I'll set that to the side, but I think it may um, underlie yeah. a number of the questions that are coming up here. But um, I'll just go ahead and read uh, the questions that were or the question that came up. And yeah, we can we can uh, go off of yeah. those. Um, the question came that says regarding practice and as a uh, follow up to the earlier question on Salat and Dua, um, I have heard from others, including those of the Ismaili community, that there is technically no Salat in uh, Ismaili community, but instead Dua daily. Is this true or are you saying that Salat and Dua is the same? I believe you did answer that question, but um, if you want to uh, allude to it and is Salat not required as a pillar in Ismaili Islam? Um, no, no. Uh, salat is re required as a pillar in Ismaili Islam. Uh, we simply interpret it differently, uh, right? Um, so I think if you define Salat as just the way Sunni Muslims do namaz, um, you know, it's, uh, no, we don't do Sunni namaz, right? But I think it's also worth noting, right? Um, you know, while there is general consensus, uh, around what the namaz consists of, right? We also need to realize that, um, uh, you know, that the form of namaz, right, comes from tradition, right? Not the not the Quran. And that the four legal schools themselves differ, right? So for example, um, I believe it's the Malikis who say you do not recite the Basmalah loudly, right? They don't even consider it as part of Fatiha, I think, right? Or the Hanafis who say you recite the Bismillah but silently, or the Shafis, you know, um, who say recite it loudly, 
Right. So there's even disagreement, some disagreement on these minute, there's some, you know, minute things, but nevertheless, the form comes from tradition, right? So like when we look at, when we look at Shia communities in general, we, you, one thing I think that's important to note is, right, Shias do not consider like Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. We don't, like, these are not texts we look to, right? Because these are Sunni texts, right? We have our own, 12 Shias have their own um, four books of Hadith. Ismais have their own Faramin that we look to, right? So I think because you have different sources uh, to interpret the Kitab, Allah, and the Sunnah, you all, you end up necessarily will end up with different little differences in form. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for for that insightful answer, Ali John. I think that's great. And that, that really hits at it. Um, and the next question was, regard. I believe it's also related to a question that uh, Kristen had lifted up in the chat. Uh, but this question is uh, as regarding accessibility. Um, uh, first, it's a two-part question. Um, one, how can one become Ismaili? Um, and relatedly, perhaps, if only Ismailis can enter and attend prayers in an Ismaili center or Jamaat Khana, how can non-Ismailis potentially observe and potentially consider reversion or conversion to Ismaili Islam, um, whether they are already a Muslim or a non-Muslim at the present moment? Yeah, um, so... Yeah, there's a way. So, I mean, so for example, if you want to learn the Ismaili Dua, it is actually already published like in academic papers and you can find it online. You can learn it if you are, if you're interested in the experience of it. Um, even the translation of it is available, right? These are things you can sort of find online. But so when it comes to practicing or observing inside the Jamaat Khana, um, so usually what happens is, right, um, you will approach the community. Usually you can ask the community member and they'll tell you who to approach. And there's sort of a process, right, where you will go through, you know, they'll basically just teach you basics of Akira and Fiqh and these sorts of things, right? Like it's very basic just to make sure that like, oh, this is something you really want to do, you know. Um, and then once you go through that process and you've, you can recite your du'a, then like you're sort of welcome in the Jamaat Kana, no problem. It's like a fairly easy process. Um, but like for a non ismaili to observe, right? I think there's also, right? Not only is there this idea, right? That there's this baya aspect, right? Similar to how Sufi Tariqas will not allow people to enter their spaces unless you've given baya to the shay, right? Um, right, there's also the idea of like, safety for Ismaili communities. Ismaili communities, uh, especially in the East, um, are persecuted, um, you know, just because of, you know, you know, uh, historical situations. And so there's also this aspect of safety, why um, sometimes, you know, people are just not allowed inside. But like, you go to an Ismaili center, for example, like in Toronto, um, uh, you can visit, like you can like go inside the prayer space, even just not during prayer time, but you can go inside the prayer space. There's no issue with that. Um, um, there are even many new Jamaat kind of also have spaces for non smileys as well. Um, so like, there's definitely like, there's definitely opportunity. Like if you're interested in like learning more, interacting with the community, there's definitely opportunity there. Definitely. And uh, based off of what you're familiar with or are aware of um, to Christian's, uh, sorry, Christian's question, um, would you say that the community is growing or uh, getting smaller in number or, and also where is it principally located or based out of now? Yeah, I think, I think definitely it's still the most amount of Ismaili. It's actually very hard to say. And I, the reason I say it is because we don't know how many Ismailis are in Western China. Um, there is a, uh, there's a lot of Ismailis there. Um, we just don't know how many. We also don't know how many Ismailis we there are in Iran because after the revolution, we sort of lost contact with some of those communities. Um, so oftentimes you will see Jamaat Khanas in sort of, you know, countries where that are not welcome to Ismailis. Uh, the Jamaat Khanas are sort of underground. Like there are Jamaat Khanas in Saudi Arabia, but, you know, you can't find it on Google Maps like you could, you know, in Toronto, for example. Um, I think generally the 
number is somewhere between 10 and 15 million currently. Are smileys growing or decreasing? It's it's really, it's it, it's quite hard to know just because so many, right? Like a majority, a lot of the smileys in Pakistan live in like the mountainous regions in Hunza, Gilgit, those areas, right? Uh, same thing in Central Asia, in Tajikistan, um, in Iran, in Afghanistan, which is now under Taliban rule. So how do you even check how many, I mean, smileys can't even, come out and say we're a smiley, right? Lots of people, you, they can't even say they're a smiley, you know, uh, because uh, you know, safety issues, right? Um, so it, it's really hard to say if it's growing or shrinking. I, I don't know. Um, but if I were to guess, I would probably say it's like it's stable, you know, because like we don't, like you have to, one thing you have to understand, the smiley, at least the Nizari smileys, we no longer do missionary work, right? We don't do dawah. We don't, we're not, we're not sort of interested in converting the world. Like for us, right. And I have a slide on this if we want to see, but like for us, right. We understand this sort of diversity of creation as a gift. We, we don't want to homogenize. We don't want to do that. And um, we see diversity as a gift. We see the plural, the, the, the diversity within Islam as a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. So like we're not trying to homogenize there. Um, so um, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of the insight to that question on the communities that are uh, kind of off the radar, off the grid, um, whether by marginalization or just by the political uh, events and and um, that's been unfolding. Uh, I know you know across the Muslim world in general, uh, our the Muslim communities' birth rates are usually kind of like the biggest driver of uh, their yeah. growth in and of themselves. Um, but to to kind of hear a little bit about the focus not necessarily being so much on proselytization or evangelization of, of this of this kind of uh of this comparison but more in a sense of uh upholding and uplifting the innate diversity of uh, you know humanity and and its manifest form and operating in that sense um and the last two questions that we've got uh one comes with respect to uh the uh, I think the question that uh, brother chance just lifted up is there a preferred, uh, I think, translator or translation of the Quran uh, by, I think, Shia Ismailis, um, or to your understanding of Shia Muslims, uh, that, that is used comparable to something like Abdullah Yusuf Ali and, you know, the sorts yeah, and yeah. many, many Sunni communities. Yeah, um, there is no preferred translation. Um, you know, uh, I think, though, if you are looking for a good translation, um, I like Pictol and I like the study Quran. Those are the two I like to use. Um, uh, the study Quran is great because it provides tough seers from the 12 er Shia tradition as well and the Sunni tradition. So, um, and the scholars who oversaw it, one of them was Maria Dakake, Joseph Lombard, Sayyid Hossein Nasser are all wonderful scholars and wonderful people. So I think uh, the study Quran, I, I, um, I would just, yeah, you could consult that. But no, there's no sort of preferred translation. Awesome. And the last question I have is uh, for, uh, you, you've kind of alluded to this, you know, in general, in in, in many areas, Ismaili uh, Muslims and communities are persecuted, uh, whether in Pakistan and, you know, uh, Afghanistan and other spaces uh, for, you know, no other act other than their identity other than being a part of Ismaili, uh, you know, Islam or identifying as Ismailis, unfortunately. And, you know, just thinking about for us here in the in the US or anywhere we may be, uh, what have you kind of come across as some of the biggest misconceptions um, about uh, Ismaili uh, Muslims or Ismaili Islam? Not just like, you know, the misconceptions that are like, oh, like, you know, there's uh, I don't I'm not sure if y'all do this or not. But some of the ones that may foster and engender some more malicious uh, things that yeah. like, oh, Ismailis don't do this or Ismailis are this or that. Um, so I wonder if you could uh, share a little bit about um, what some of those uh, kind of more glaring misconceptions are. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of like weird polemical websites as well against the Ismais that are can be quite funny sometimes um some of them claim we have a trinity um some of them say we don't pray some of them say we consider the imam to be god and and these sorts of things um i i would say like 
Ismailis don't pray is like probably the biggest, one of the biggest mis misconceptions I've seen popular Sunni ulema like Hamza Yusuf repeat this absurd, uh, right, uh, this absurd statement. I mean, uh, Ismailis pray, technically we have, you know, we're not, uh, I think, you know, uh, you know, we do 18 rakats a day, right? We recite, do, you know, has sujood, Quranic recitation, we pray. There's lots of isagata and talwasul. We do dhikr, tasbih, right? Like, Ismail prayer is quite involved. There's lots of devotional literature that's recited in the Jamaat Kanan, the Ginans, which are, there's a whole, you can, there's a searchable Ginan database, the University of Saskatchewan hosts where you can listen and read Ginans if you want. Um, but no, these are, I mean, you know, and, you know, uh, the, the prayer is, is actually takes a long time and is a very involved process. So, um, yeah, it's, it's my pray. Um, the other big, I think the other big mis misconception is, right, and this is what I was referring to about Tawassul, right, because, like, we do invoke the prophet and the imams in prayer, right? Um, but I think this is, people have, the people who um, peddle this misconception are generally people who don't know their own tradition very well, because, again, right, classical mainstream Sunni Islam that is that Tawasul and Isagata are not only permissible but they're beneficial right so um this idea of intercession right is not something that is sort of alien uh to any Muslim tradition and so uh maybe except the Salafis uh, yeah except the Salafis and Wahhabis who are very anti-intercession um so yeah, 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 I think this is right. We do not consider, uh, you know, the Ismais actually have probably the most radical uh, idea of Tawheed of oneness, right? Ismais uphold the doctrine of divine simplicity, right? We do not, we believe God transcends all attributes and names, um, right? This is very different um, from like the Maturidi and the Ashari traditions, which say, right, there are, God has distinct attributes and these sorts of things. And um of course, they suspend, um, you know, they won't say whether, you know, they are God or not God or whatever, but they, they suspend uh, when it comes to that. But nevertheless, right, Ismailis, you know, have a very radical idea of, of Tawheed, absolute unity, right? We don't believe in distinct attributes. We, we say God transcends all attributes, right? That's clearly not the Imam, right? The Imam is, we just say the Imam is inspired. Um, so... Yeah, I think those, I think the Imam is God and Ismail is don't pray are probably the two biggest misconceptions, um, you know, that I know of. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And then those, you know, unfortunately are ones I've come across uh, you know, in, yeah. in, in different <laughs> ways. And, and so it's good to hear uh, a little yeah. bit, you know, about them. And and and, and unfortunately, you know, how, how how that comes about, but to to be able to dive into uh, really, uh, you know, deconstructing those thoughts. Um, the, the absolute last question I just want to ask for the sake of our audience, um, but also, for folks here who may predominantly be coming from a non-Ismaili background, um, I think you alluded to this in, in an earlier question of getting plugged in for uh, more information on uh, learning about Ismaili theology and and then study of it. But for folks that are um, here in their communities or in any any other space, uh, how can they get either plugged into or connected uh, with the what may be their local Ismaili community or their local Ismaili Jamaat Khana, just as a way of uh, getting connected to them uh, for further questions, resource, and so on and so forth. Is there uh, uh, yeah. a space for that or any recommendations that you have for folks in getting connected? Um, usually you can find like online, like, um, like who to contact um, at local Ismaili communities. Now, like, Smaller communities, let's say like in like, you know, like Cleveland or something where there are not many Ismailis, right? They don't typically will not get involved in outreach programs. But like if you're located in like Los Angeles or Houston or Dallas, um, where there's largest money populations, there's lots of outreach. Um, so usually you can just you can just find it online, um, right? The official website of the Ismailis is b.ismaili. Um, and you can find, that's like our official community website. So the, you know, you can find a lot of like information on that. Um, 
you know, in terms of getting into, so like if you're in one of these big places, usually like their contact information or their email is online on the dot smiley, I think. And sorry, I, I'm not too involved with the outreach though. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know too well, but I can, I can definitely, I, I can, I'll also try to find out more. And uh, if there's certain communities people are from and are interested in, um, you know, uh, I can also help find the information and I can give it to you. Um, you know, uh, but I think generally on B dot is my, you should be able to find what you're looking for. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, well, that's all the questions that we've got here. And again, I know we've taken uh, y'all's time uh, a little bit over and Ali John, thank you so much for the grace that you've given for uh, allowing us to go a little over time, but we really do appreciate um, the wisdom and the insight with which you came and uh, have shared uh, to us about the Ismaili community. I know that uh, we're just scratching the surface and there's so many different things that we can dive into. Like you said, it may be a year long seminar, um, but it's definitely <laughs> piqued that interest. So um, as for everybody here, uh, we will definitely send y'all a recap kind of email and inshallah consolidate the different links and resources. So of course, I'll touch base with Ali John and uh, we'll send that there. If there's any questions that you might have, uh, feel free to uh, continue to send them to myself or respond back uh, to the email that we send and we'll do our best to get you plugged in for the answers that are there. Inshallah, we'll continue Inside Islam uh, next month and in the coming months here. So stay on uh, stay on the lookout for um, the announcement about that. But again, Ali John uh, on Bath Muslim Space and everybody here, really, yeah. really appreciate you putting uh, so much effort into not just the presentation, but uh, being able to uh, share uh, so much about uh, this beautiful tradition, uh, beautiful community, uh, with us today. And inshallah, as one of my teachers taught, this is not the end of a conversation. It's just a pause and uh, we'll begin it uh, at another time in another Zoom space. But thank you so much again, Ali. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you all again. Uh, best of uh, luck to everybody else. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Stay tuned for future events. Assalamu alaikum.